My life is the story of a young man obsessed with music, fame, and hats, um, who went on a journey of um, intoxico dandyism into the nether world of melody. Um, something like that, I don't know. Yeah, I need some more time to think about it. It's a lot of pressure. These lights, first of all, these lights are, it's not my usual morning, you know? Will you describe this, this life between creation, destruction, and hope? Am I right? Probably. I mean, that's the same for all of us, isn't it, you know? For humanity, for human beings, you know? I'm not from a different species as you, you know? We create, we destroy. Some of us have hope, I think. I think there's still hope. I enjoy stories. I love stories. I like telling stories, hearing stories, sharing stories. I like communal singing, communal dancing. I like making music. I tried doing other jobs, you know. I didn't really have the discipline or the energy for manual work. And I didn't have the discipline for, you know, writing, which was my, my, my first dream. But music and, and lyrics came quite easily. And so it's a good way for me to pay pay the bills as well. Um, I don't know what else it's I do. It's a nice job. Uh, I don't know. It's well. I think if I was born rich, it would be a nice job because I wouldn't care if the music sold, or if I was su successful commercially. You know, in like in this capitalist system, I wouldn't care about that because I'd already have the the security. But if you have to do it to survive, I don't think it is a nice job. I think you, you, you start making trade-offs, you know, between what's commercial and what you really believe in. No, I think it can be like a really, for the soul, for the creative soul, I think it's a really dangerous job to be an artist, struggling artist, unless you're so consumed by what you do, you don't care about you know, how you live or, or what you eat. But I, don't, I wouldn't call it a nice job, no. No? No, it feels more like being at war a lot of the time. But when you love what you're doing, you love music. Mm? So if you love what you're doing... Yeah, well, some people love being in the army, but they don't enjoy killing, you know what I mean? But that's, that's basically what, what the job is in the army, you know? Yeah. It's warm in here. I'm going to take this off. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I've never really considered myself a musician. No, I've never been able to read music or write music. I was just sort of had an ear for guitar noise and building songs around that and then working with talented musicians. I, I enjoy music. You know, I do enjoy music, but I wouldn't say I give my life to music. Yeah. Bonsoir, suite à un retard dû à la SNCF, le concert de Pete de Harty commencera vers 23h, 23h15. No, you've got no idea. We've been through hell and high water. It's four, and a, four and a half hours we've been on this train now. It's an absolute joke. I don't know if you can hear me, but listen, I'm gonna. I'll try and do this for you, like. If Queen Bowl is see long dead and gone. Well, but where your dreams? Nightmares at that time. Sorry, ask question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. My dreams and nightmares have always been com connected, really. You know, sometimes it's hard to differentiate between the two because a lot of the time, the thing that that you think is making you happy, for one better word, is actually killing you. You know, whether it be your band or or drugs or, you know, what is, it, what is supposed to be healing you or giving your life meaning and substance can often be the thing that's actually destroying you, mm. you know? So what's the dream and what's the nightmare and when did it change and who decides? Well, obviously, you decide. Hmm. I think I've lived a lot of my life like that, you know, maybe put myself in situations where I get that rush of fear and then try and control it. And a lot of the time you can't and you end up, you know, on your ass, you know, you end up fucked, like, in prison or covered in blood. But, but those things as well are experiences that, 
nightmare experiences that can lead to dreamlike sequences. Mm. You know? And that's what painting and writing songs are as well, really. You're constructing your own dreams and your own nightmares. I mean, personally, I write quite a lot of melancholy songs, dark songs. Mm. And sometimes they're about reality, but sometimes they're just... And love songs. Yeah, but I love songs as well, so that's the dream side of it. My favourite genre really is black black comedy, you know? Yeah. Where you get the uplifting. You're English. Huh? You are an English man. I am indeed, yes. <laughs> and you, sir, are a Frenchman. <laughs> Don't deny it. I said it, I said it. Uh, I was asking you if at that time you will say that all the paparazzi around, was it a nightmare, that way? Or life? Or period of life, or just boring. Yeah, I don't know about boring. I mean, it was it was pretty irritating because I mean, I let a lot of things go. I let a lot of things slide. You know, I'm quite laissez-faire with people. But actually, I think in my own way, I like I like to have a certain amount of control. And you can have no control. Was that world? You can't, you can't manipulate it. I tried, you know. I tried everything, you know. Finding out where they live, you know what I mean. Setting fire to their cars. You can't stop them. It's like a battle. You really, you can't win, because they got so much. I mean, so much access to people's ideas, and I'm interested in people's ideas and what they think and what they think of me. And that was like a huge, that was like my Waterloo. If I was Napoleon, the tabloids was my Waterloo because they put so many fucking lies in, you know. Every tabloids were speaking about you all the time. I know, but it was, they was, weren't saying, they weren't talking about the songs or saying, oh, what a lovely hat. They were saying, like, you know, what an evil bastard. They were calling me an evil bastard. They were calling me a scumbag. They were getting me arrested. They were getting me in so much trouble. And, uh, Yeah, it's awful. How awful. What are you going to do? You know what I mean? You just pray that people don't really believe it. But of course they don't, but that's not the point. It's still not nice, you know what I mean? It's like someone shouting at you in the street. You know, oi, connas. Do you know what I mean? It's like that, but really loud, right in your ear. Do you know what I mean? You can't, it's hard to ignore. Uh, the, the way we've always communicated with each other successfully is through music, and that sounds weird enough, but it's true. And, uh, That's how and why we're together. And sorry, oh. yeah. uh, I, had to I don't know you, eh? Because we haven't actually been in a room alone together. So, um, do, do, do you see this as part of your rehabilitation? Rehabilitation from what? Well, you know, your, your drug problems are well known. Is this part? Is this Not really? I'm trying to keep that as quite as possible. But like, um, where did you accept that this moment to be? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time, you know. It's yeah. like, so much fun, and uh, it wasn't easy to watch because it turned out to be because I got clean. I think uh, it made sense for Katia to make a film about addiction, survival, I suppose, kind of redemption with the family story of my father. But. It wasn't, that wasn't on the cards, really. I mean, I never thought I would get clean, to be honest. I thought heroin was kind of one of the gang as well. You know what I mean? It was always there. I felt like I had a, a balanced relationship with it. I didn't realize at the time that I could really just shut the door to it. I thought it would always find a way back in. And as I said before, I'm quite laissez-faire with people who've been like destructive in my life. I always tend to forgive, you know, and invite them back to destroy more. But with heroin, it's just been five years and it, it's just not there now. I don't know. I mean, he's out there. I know he's out there somewhere, you know, destroying other lives. But yeah, I thought we were in, in it together for, for the, long, the long term, you know is that that's, what my, that's how my father saw me for a long time. He didn't, he didn't really have any interest in my music. He just thought I was a junkie and a disgrace, you know? So it's quite, you know, fathers are quite 
the subject of fathers is always quite uh, quite difficult, you know. Because he never, when I was a child, he never read the tabloids, you know. He had no, he was always very, he'd talk about them because it was, it was the army and all soldiers, they read the tabloids, the Sun, the Daily Mirror, but he would always say, ah, oh, these, these newspapers, that's not real news. And then suddenly, when I was in the tabloids, he would suddenly really believe, believe it like it was the gospel or something, you know? So it was very difficult, that. How much did you go out from, from that, from that period where you were using drugs? Um, well, you just stopped taking drugs, really, but you never really, um, to use your father's word, you never really stopped being an addict or a junkie. You just stopped taking drugs. You always have that, that fight, that battle. Do you know what I mean? You don't really stop. You don't really come out of it. It's like, I don't know how to describe it, really, to you. It's a bit like diabetes, really, mm. you know? If you have too much sugar, get diabetes and you can stop taking sugar after that but you're still you still have diabetes it's like that with addiction I think you're born with it and if you've managed to survive because it's a it's a uh, a chronic illness you know it only gets worse you can't maintain addiction some people can but very few so it will kill you if you don't stop same with sugar and diabetes if you keep taking sugar keep drinking alcohol you will uh, you will die of diabetes eventually Same with addiction. So you don't get out of it. The addiction is st it's still there. It's just waiting, like in the corner, you know, doing push ups, lifting weights, waiting for me to say, ah, you know what? <sighs> yeah, maybe today. And you'll be like, all right, let's do it, baby. You know what I mean? Oops. You're living in France. For yes, a long I'm time. living in France for a long time. So, what is your favorite cheese? It really depends on how, what time of day it is, what, um, what I've eaten before. I do like Roquefort, you know, and all those types of cheeses, you know, the really sort of sour taste. Uh, I like Lay de Chèvre, you know, <laughs> ghost cheese and... But um, Comte, I like, yeah, Emmental. And of course, I like Camembert and Brie, but really, Soft, sticky. Ooh, you're making me hungry now. <laughs> you're a Frenchman. You've lived in France for a long time. What's your favorite cheese, Sebastian? Uh, Comté. Comté is nice, yeah. That's sort of salty. Then Beaufort. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Pont Evesque as well, I quite like. But it has to be oh, really, no, it has to be really soft. You know, I don't like it when it's straight from the fridge or it's too hard. I like it when it's soft. My last question is going to be the Peter of today. Uh, what will you say to the Peter? Who begins to play in the Libertines more than something like 20 years ago? I've always this, this these questions always interested me. I have been I have been asked it before and I've always struggled to answer it. I end up saying something just flippant, but the honest answer is I don't think I would I don't think I would say anything. I don't think I could say anything. He'd just be like, who's this fat old bloke, you know what I mean, who are you, you know what I mean, you're shabby. Um, I'd probably just observe from a distance, I think I'd enjoy that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and get involved, I'd just observe, because I, I, seem to have, I seem to have an awful lot of energy back then, you know, and when I think back, and I look back at, I was really driven, you know, really driven and I felt kind of bulletproof in a way, you know? I mean, I was like, I was quite sensitive, you know, or sensible, as you say in France, but actually, even though I felt the pain and the, and the, and the suffering, it didn't ever stop me. And now, like, you know, 25 years later, I feel like I'm a little bit slower, you know what I mean? And more like, oh, I'm gonna... but that guy back then was really just and now I'm doing this, I don't care, fuck off. Um, I just watch him, I think, maybe try and draw some of his energy from him, for myself. It's a bit weird. Um, yeah, vampire-like. I don't know, I'm, yeah, I like these, I like these uh, hypothetical 
questions. It's difficult though, isn't it? I mean, if you see yourself in another dimension from years ago, what would you say to yourself? I would say to myself, uh, look, Sebastian, in 20 years, you will be uh, speaking... Oh, no, you said, no, 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 <laughs> don't, don't say that, don't you're, say you're that. You're listening to the Libertines and in some years, you're going to, to speak about uh, Frenchies with Peter Arti in Brut. Great, so, kill. To speak with you. No problem, Sebastian. Bon voyage. Merci. Merci.